Welcome to Music History Monday for September 19th, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Day Gigs. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. Don't give up your day gig, along with don't eat yellow snow and fake it till you make it. Don't give up your day gig remains one of the oldest, hoariest, cliched pieces of advice anyone can give or receive. But unless you were lucky slash wise enough to heed the other greatest piece of advice any musician can receive, that being marry rich. Don't give up your day gig is still among the very best pieces of advice a musician can receive. Very few of us get our dream job right out of school. Hell, very few of us ever get our dream job. All too rapidly, reality intrudes on youthful artistic idealism, and no matter how much one wants to compose or play violin or sing, Unless we can find someone willing to pay us to do so, we must all do something to make money. And then, as we get older and develop a taste for the finer things in life, like feeding, clothing, and housing our children, our day gigs become not just a matter of survival for ourselves, but for those around us. Now, here and there, and every now and then, someone gets very lucky and actually scores a career and, as a result, can give up their day gig. Such fine people are the subjects of today's post. Let us begin, then, with our date-appropriate example. On September 19th, 1960, 62 years ago today, Chubby Checker, born Ernest Evans, October 3rd, 1941, went to number one on Billboard's Hot 100 chart with his performance of the rhythm and blues song, The Twist. For our additional information, on October 11th, 2012, the Chubster set a world record in DeLand, Florida. That's when and where He sang the twist to a crowd of some 4,000 people who twisted along with him, breaking the previous Guinness World Record for most people twisting at once. One wonders what the record might be for the most people doing the boogaloo. Young Ernest Evans was lucky enough to score what was his first major hit some five months before his 19th birthday. As a result, he was able to quit his day gig, that of a chicken plucker for a firm called Fresh Farm Poultry, which was located at the Italian Produce Market, or the South 9th Street Curb Market, in South Philadelphia. Yeah, for our information, though born in Spring Gully, South Carolina, Evans slash Checker grew up in the projects of South Philly. A great story. The naturally outgoing young Evans entertained customers at the poultry market with his singing, even as he shucked and plucked. It was his boss at the market, someone known today only as Tony A., who nicknamed him Chubby. But even more important was the owner of Fresh Farm Poultry, a man named Henry Holt. Holt was so taken with Chubby and his talent that he arranged for him to make a private recording with Dick Clark, the host of Philadelphia's own American Bandstand. It was Dick Clark's first wife, Barbara, born Mallory, that completed Chubby's stage name. She asked him what his name was, and he replied, quote, Well, my friends call me Chubby. As he had just completed a Fats Domino impression, she smiled and said, as in checker? 
that little play on words, chubby describing a degree of fatness, and checkers being like dominoes, a tabletop game, got an instant laugh and stuck. From then on, Evans would use the name Chubby Checker, unquote. To the point, after July of 1960, Ernest Evans, now Chubby Checker, never had to pluck another chicken, at least not for money. I have done some research and have discovered that Chubby Checker's day gig was not even close to being the worst among certain popular musicians of note. In the spirit of sharing, then, here's what I came up with. Again, these are all pop musicians. We'll deal with the day gigs of concert musicians at another time. We begin with Ozzy Osbourne. Well, of course we're beginning with John Michael Ozzy Osbourne, who grew up in Birmingham, England. Of course because it makes sense that this arguably most disgusting of all rockers should have had the most disgusting day gig. For those who would take issue with my unkind appraisal of Maestro Osborne based on the daffy, vaguely comic, semi-brain-dead individual that appeared on the reality show The Osbournes, which ran from 2002 to 2005, well, here's a reminder. The Bathead incident notwithstanding, for details, I would direct your attention to my Music History Monday post for January 20th, 2020, a post entitled Fine Dining. In 1979, Osborne was fired from the heavy metal band Black Sabbath because of his drug and alcohol issues. Do we all appreciate how stoned and drunk Osborne had to habitually be in order to be fired by a heavy metal band, the mind reels. Oh, on being fired by Black Sabbath, Osborne remembered, quote, I'd got 96,000 pounds for my share of the band's name, so I'd just lock myself away and spend three months doing coke and booze. My thinking was, this is my last party, because after this I'm going back to Birmingham and on the dole." Unquote. Anyway, before his music career took off and Osborne became the purported Prince of Darkness, he worked in an abattoir. Because I know you want to know the technical difference between a slaughterhouse and an abattoir is that in a slaughterhouse, animals are merely killed. In an abattoir, they are killed and processed. Quote, by the time an animal has gone through an abattoir, it has been reduced to carcass, bones, offal, blood, and skin. Unquote. Ozzy Osbourne fondly recalled his job. Quote, I had to slice open the cow carcasses and get all the gunk out of their stomachs. I used to vomit every day. The smell was something else." Unquote. Oh, how delightful! Apparently for Osborne, working in an abattoir was one of the few jobs that could make playing in a heavy metal band feel like a step up. Lucky for him, David Bowie, 1947 to 2016, worked at the other end of the meat processing and packing industry. Raised in London in 1960 at the age of 13, Bowie got his first job, working as a delivery boy for a butcher shop. Bowie got the job in order to help pay for lessons from the famed Indian-born baritone saxophonist Ronnie Ross, who lived from 1933 to 1991. In what must be considered a really nice touch, Eleven years later, Bowie hired Ross to play the solo saxophone part on Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side, a recording that he, Bowie, produced. Kurt Donald Cobain, 1967 to 1994, was born in Aberdeen, Washington State, and died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in Seattle. 
We are told that musically he was an exponent of grunge, which is defined as, quote, an alternative rock genre and subculture that emerged during the mid-1980s in the American Pacific Northwest state of Washington, particularly in Seattle and nearby towns. Grunge fuses elements of punk rock and heavy metal, but without punk's structure and speed, unquote. Um, without punk's structure? Can someone, anyone, explain to me what constitutes structure in punk rock? Before hitting the charts, Cobain worked as a janitor. He was once asked in an interview to discuss grunge in terms of his janitorial experience. This is what he said, quote, When I was a janitor, I used to work with these guys called Rocky and Bullwinkle. They'd clean the toilet bowls with their bare hands and then eat their lunch without washing their hands. They were very grungy, unquote. Yes. <laughs> Yes, they were. While we're discussing day gigs held by members of the Cobain family, we might as well include Kurt Cobain's wife, Courtney Love, who, in fact, did everything in her power to save her husband from himself, though sadly without success. Ms. Love, herself a walking advertisement for the grunge aesthetic, worked at Hollywood's Jumbo Clown Room as a stripper, a day gig, or in this case, a night gig, which likely surprises not a one of us. According to Love, quote, Stripping funded my band. There was a lot of temptation in terms of drugs back then. I was like, okay, when I make a million dollars, then I'll do all the drugs I want. Which I did, by the way. Unquote. In 1961, at the age of 18, Michael Philip Mick Jagger, born 1943, worked as a porter at the Bexley Psychiatric Hospital in Dartford Heath, Bexley, in the county of Kent. I have not been able to discover the particular range of his responsibilities at the hospital. However, according to the man himself, he lost his virginity in a storeroom there to a nurse. This is a level of fringe benefit I have yet to experience at any level of my own employment. Just saying. Keith Richards, born 1943. Let us stick with the stones for a further moment, or in Richards' case, the balls. His father was an avid tennis player, and from a young age, Keith watched his father play. At the age of 13, he was hired by his father's tennis club to work as a ball boy during the weekends. Oh, how nice. Finally, a job that didn't involve animal carcasses, toilets, the public removal of clothing, or losing one's virginity in a storage closet. As opposed to Patti Smith's epically awful job in a toy factory. After graduating from Deptford High School in southern New Jersey in 1964, Ms. Smith, born in 1946, took a summer job at a local toy factory where her responsibilities included, quote, fixing boxes and testing toys, unquote. Okay, okay, a helpful hint to everybody. Between high school graduation and freshman year of college, do not take a job at a toy factory in South Jersey. Tall, gangly, sickly, with a lazy left eye, Patti Smith was mercilessly victimized by her co-workers. She recalled, quote, The stuff those women did to me in that factory was horrible. They'd gang up on me and stick my head in a toilet full of piss, unquote. Having myself grown up in South Jersey, I would observe that this is often a sign of affection in that part of the Garden State, and that as such, Patti Smith should have been grateful that her co-workers liked her. Kanye 
Omari West, born 1977. As a teenager, the always adorable Ye worked as a sales assistant at The Gap. It's an experience he rapped about in his song Spaceship, a rap that depicts him as being, how might we say this, a rather less than ideal employee. I quote that rap lyric. Man, 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 if my manager insults me again, I will be assaulting him. After I fuck the manager up, then I'm going to shorten the register up. Let's go back, back to the gap. Look at my check. Wasn't no scratch. So if I stole, wasn't my fault. Yeah, I stole. Never got caught. They take me to the back room and pat me, asking me about some khakis. But let some black people walk in. I bet they show off their token blackie. Oh, now they love Kanye. Let's put them all in front of the store. Saw him on break next to the no smoking sign with a blunt in the mall. Taking my hits, writing my hits, writing my rhymes, playing my mind. This fucking job can't help him, so I quit. Y'all welcome. Okay, then. Goodness, we could go on and on. Tom Waits worked as a dishwasher and then as a pizza cook at Napoleone Pizza House in San Diego. Rod Stewart worked as a gravedigger at the Highgate Cemetery in London. Freddie Mercury ran a stall at London's Kensington Market, where he sold his own artwork and secondhand clothing, and worked as well as a luggage handler at Heathrow Airport. Even after he began regularly gigging in St. Louis with the Johnny Johnson Band in 1952, the 26-year-old Chuck Berry kept his day job as a hairdresser for three more years. We'd make one further most pertinent observation. All the good people and uh, not-so-good people just mentioned, from Chubby Checker to Chuck Berry, made the big time and left their day gigs far behind. But as we all know, there's no guarantee that success will be any more than a quick flash in the pan. We trust these people felt a degree of security, knowing that they all had skilled careers to fall back on. Particularly you, Ozzy. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.